Welcome back, folks. We have some fantastic um, speakers lined up over the next hour and a half, and I'm really looking forward to it myself, I have to say, and I hope you are also. Um, the theme of our Congress is the power of the collective, business angels, seed funds, accelerators, and incubation space. And um, in that regard, we've put together this um, session, Syndication and Co-Investment by Angels and VC, and we hope to have a very lively discussion. And I really do um, think we will have lots of questions from the floor. So the microphones have been positioned along the middle, three of them. So when you're ready afterwards, folks, you can make your way to the microphones and ask questions, and hopefully that works quite well. Um, very quickly, Paolo on the left needs no introduction. Next to me, um, a man that probably needs very little introduction to anybody familiar with the angel world, um, David Rose. Um, um, in, <laughs> thanks, Candice. Um, David Rose, known, known as the Archangel of New York um, by Forbes, founder of New York Business Angels, investor in over 80 companies, and more recently a founder of Gust. Um, delighted to be joined by Jared Ryan. Jared is a partner at Eversheds, the international law firm, and Mark Hor Horgan. And Mark is chair of the Irish Venture Capital Association. Um, so what I'm going to do, folks, is maybe just kick it off by getting a little bit of input from the panel, and then we'll try and maybe come to the floor. So David, I will start with yourself if it's okay. Um, excuse me, I know you can cover the complete spectrum for us. I heard you talk in Washington a, a little while back on the whole range of um, investment um, options from individual angels to groups of angels and even some of the newer uh, activities in the crowdfunding area. So you might like to share perhaps with us what you're seeing in the US today and how it has evolved um, over time. Sure. What has happened uh, in the U.S. and internationally, as we've been seeing, is a real change in the early stage financing market. If you think back to the ancient dark ages of hundreds of years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth and, and the only place to get early stage funding was from venture capital funds, a VC fund would explore uh, a lot of opportunities and then to give a term sheet and make an investment and typically one entity would invest and fund a company. Uh, as the technology advancement has continued, and as you have uh, cheaper and cheaper costs of starting a company, it requires less cash up front. There, we have a globalized world, there are more entrepreneurs, and as the number has dropped down, it means less money is required to start a company, which means that you have a broader base to choose from. So that's where business angels come into play. So you can invest 20,000 euro in, or 25,000 dollars in the US uh, as, a, as an entry point. And so what we are seeing now in, in the last several years and accelerating very rapidly is not one venture capital fund investment investing in a company, nor even what we saw after that, which is one angel group investing in a company. So New York Angels, uh, the group that I founded, would typically provide a term sheet to a company and do an entire round of 500,000 or 750,000 US. What we're seeing now is an enormous amount of syndication and collaboration among individual business angels, business angel networks, early stage seed funds, most of which have just started within the last five to 10 years. Um, and so the, it's a very interesting world of shifting alliances. There are, we see fewer people doing the same deals all the time with the same people, but instead um, you'll see individuals with a fund, individuals with a, a venture fund, an angel, business angel network, multiple angel networks, Work syndicating. Uh, the Gust is our collaboration platform, which allows multiple groups to work together in the same deal room. We're seeing that increasingly. So I would say of the, the last 20 deals that New York Angels has funded, every single one of them had some other player or players in the mix. And in that regard, are you seeing um, in, the, in the US in particular, I guess, a lot of you know, verticalization or specialization in particular verticals from these new seed funds you have or from the angel groups? Yes, to, well, well, what's happening now in, and the reason business angels uh, have exploded and startups are exploding is because technology has moved 25 years ago Technology meant, oh, you were making computer chips or it was doing maybe a medical device or um, pure software. Today, we're seeing what we call hyphen tech. So there is financial technology and advertising technology and fashion technology and food technology and all these other kinds of technology applied to existing businesses. Um, and that means there is, instead of being a technology expert, it's now domain experts you're looking at. So we see just in New York, we have special business angel networks designed around fashion, designed around life sciences, obviously, around social networking, around real estate, around a whole bunch of different kinds of, of technology. Just, just listening to you, actually, on that conversation, I guess, parochially, on behalf of Ireland Inc., where 
we have a very significant um, agri-food and f um, food industry with over 10% of the exports off of the island um, being in that category. And probably people might not all know, but even though the population on the island is whatever, 6, 7 million, we're feeding over 70 million people, and it's strong in technology. So do you think there are opportunities perhaps um, in, in, in cross-border investing? Well, I know, but I, and also maybe more in cross-sectoral from technology into the agri oh, and food area for us as an island here. Absolutely. I mean, and one, what, but, and could you give us any advice in that regard? Well, I mean, so I, I'm in New York City, which is not exactly farm country, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the recent deals that I invested in is a company called Vital Herd, which, which, which is doing tracking of the health of cattle mm -hmm. by implanted sensors and stuff. Okay, so mm -hmm. not exactly my, my primary sweet spot, which tends to be <laughs> technology and financial uh, networks, but it's, it was really interesting. It was the use of applying technology, in this case, to livestock and, uh, and breeding, and you're going to see that across the board now. So I think there is an enormous amount of, of interplay when you have technology applied to everything from agriculture mm -hmm. to finance to, to the everything else. It's, it's great, great to hear that, David, genuinely, because I absolutely believe, and I, I've said to a number of people before, I think we have opportunities to do things in the ag tech sector in Ireland because of the combinations of the, uh, of the underlying skill sets. So it's uh, good to hear that. Thanks for a moment, David. Um, Mark, Mark Horgan of the Irish Venture Capital Association. Um, Mark, I think with our you know, um, audience today from all over the world, as we said earlier, but particularly, I guess, from um, Europe, it might be interesting perhaps to share um, you know, with the audience the sort of ecosystem that exists here in Ireland in terms of seed venture capital and public money and business angels and how that comes together as you see it from um, the Irish Venture Capital Association. Uh, thanks, Michael. The first thing I would say is I'd agree with everything that David has said as a guard syndication. Sorry, uh, I'd agree with everything that David has said as a guard syndication. That's exactly what we're seeing here as well. Um, if, you, if, you, if you look at the, uh, the, the ecosystem in Ireland, um, where it relates to uh, seed and early stage uh, uh, funding of companies, you've got, you've got uh, four primary seed funds in Ireland, uh, which is managing about uh, 130 million uh, euro. Uh, then you've got um, Enterprise Ireland and you've got the Privates and Angels, all co-investing together um, uh, as syndicates. Um, and I think where uh, one, one party can be very beneficial to another party in the sense that Typically, you've got the seed funds who look after the, the project management of the legals and the deal structuring, and you've got the angels who are able to concentrate on helping the uh, companies and working with them. So they're very complementary. So just to put some numbers on it, um, last year and, and for the last number of years, approximately uh, 50 million euro has been invested in Irish uh, seed uh, companies. Um, and, um, we reckon that about, uh, in the la since 2007, about 280, 386 million euros has been invested in, um, in, in seed. Thanks, thanks very much, Mark. And just to give a, a, a very quickly, maybe a typical deal, uh, what it might look like in, in when, you, when we say seed, because it can mean different things in different places around the world. Yeah, but, um, that would be, um, say, a startup where you'd have a pre-revenue pre company, um, uh, probably developing um, a product, so not over the, uh, the first product risk stage yet. And the, uh, the investors typically would be a seed fund, Enterprise Ireland, and uh, Private and Angels all um, uh, matching. Um, uh, typical size would probably be about a million euros initially. Okay, okay. Um, and maybe Mark, just uh, on that also then. So we have all these seed funds that provides a sizable pipeline. How are we doing then as we look a little bit further down the track well, for those companies at the next stage? Well, first of all, um, there's a number of issues. Um, the, the seed funds in Ireland uh, will probably run out of uh, money for new investment in about the next uh, nine months. So um, it's important that uh, the success that they've had um, and the funding that they've had in the last number of years continues. We've seen a very strong pipeline of deals uh, being built up and very good caliber of management and, um, and company founders coming through as a result of the funding from Seed um, and from Enterprise Ireland and private, the combination of Private and uh, Angel. Um, so that generates a significant pipeline for your, 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 your mainline VC fund, Series A, Series B, um, and um, you know, it, it's, uh, since I started in this business 13 years ago, there's a, there's a huge change in the volume of um, and, and the quality in the pipeline, but you know, um, 
that's not going to continue uh, unless the um, the seed funds uh, are, are funded again in the next uh, in the next 12 months. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark. Um, perhaps in the discussion that we have ongoing here, you know, this particular panel won't have time to maybe address in any detail the whole area of crowdfunding, and we have a very very strong panel on that tomorrow, which I hope you'll join us for. Um, but as I maybe bring Gerard, Gerard Ryan. And partner with Evershed's um, international law firm. And I, I guess I want to ask you, Jared, you know, the mix of funding that we're talking about, maybe the initial ones, they're reasonably straightforward, but there are probably a couple of other additional layers then. One is the cross-border, and one now is the um, evolution of crowdfunding in many different uh, respects. So what challenges maybe does that um, pose um, for companies, and what do they need to look out for? Could you maybe give us a sense, please? Yeah, I suppose in, in terms of, of crowdfunding and, and the way the platforms have moved on, um, like, like with any um, technology or as things advance, law is always playing catch up. Um, so at the moment, the regime in Ireland and in Europe generally would be um, a lot of the crowdfunding and the, particularly the equity crowdfunding where um, people are raising equity um, through platforms. They're kind of moving around existing law and um, maybe availing of exemptions, but there isn't a joined up um, uh, so legislation around crowdfunding. Some jurisdictions have managed to put, put it in place. I think the UK are looking at regulating peer-to-peer -peer lending, for example, which is currently unregulated um, for businesses. Obviously, the regulation of consumer lending, but peer-to-peer -peer -to -peer lending would be unregulated. Um, I think Italy have looked at um, some exemptions for for equity crowdfunding for what they call innovative startups. Um, but there are challenges around us, um, uh, you know, at, 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 a, at a basic level, there's restrictions on raising money from the public. Um, there are exemptions based on certain thresholds. Um, there's issues around, do you need to issue a prospectus? Um, there's issues around if, if monies are being transferred or are there payment services issues? Um, so there are issues I think that, that, that I think may delay or slow down you know, as it develops, but, but I think in due course they, they will be resolved because there seems to be a commitment um, from the European Commission to, to, to put in place some, some framework around that. So at the moment, it's slightly a grey area in terms of what's regulated, what needs to be regulated, um, but I think in due course um, that, will, that will be resolved. Grand. I might come back to you a little bit on the regulation side. Um, Paolo, I'll come to you in a moment, but perhaps just before I do, you know, having you here, David, I don't want to um, uh, let you go without perhaps asking you to give us a little bit of a perspective on the crowdfunding as you're seeing it in the States, because I know there are very serious discussions going on there with regard to the regulation of it. And, uh, well, I, yeah, I, yeah. I was restraining myself. I know, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. In. Uh, crowdfunding is an important development, and it's very interesting. But I think you have to look at crowdfunding in the context of EBA. Look at this crowd here. This is, this is a group of people who I would consider professional business angels. And what we have seen over the last decade, thanks to Iban here and thanks to the ACA in the US and, and all the things that have been happening in people in this room, um, who have been teaching and training and writing on, on the subject, there has been a professionalization of business angel investors. And that's why seed funds are happy and, and prefer to co-invest and syndicate with business angels because they are professionals and they can add value. The challenge with crowdfunding is going to be people who are not professional business angels who see something, oh, exciting, it's a new shiny toy, and they'll throw some money at it. And, and it's almost guaranteed to not end well. I mean, if you look at crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, in the pure sense as envisioned by some of the advocates, of equity crowdfunding, where anybody can just take all the money and, and put it into, into everything here. Why shouldn't they get the returns that the professionals get? Well, the answer is, as we all know, the odds of, of getting a return from your angel deal are, you know, it's, it's so, you know, one out of 10 makes the portfolio. And most crowdfunding advocates don't really get that. So, I, so the, the challenge here is going to be how to, and then we're facing that in the U.S. as well. How do you structure crowdfunding, which is valuable, so that it works, but it doesn't open up people to losing all their stuff? It's great for the company but it's the challenge is going to be to make it also decent for the investor so yeah I think so perhaps listening to you there's an evolution ongoing which is understandable but over time that the you know core business angel I guess groupings 
um, should over time perhaps be able to work with the crowdfunding when it uh, evolves and matures. And what, what we, what we yeah. believe is that the, the, there will be different structures mm -hmm. for crowdfunding versus business angels. And so the equity that business angels, uh, such as in this room, invest in, are you're, are you're buying shares in a company and it's a long-term relationship and you're waiting for your payout often for five, six, eight, ten years. The average hold for an angel investor in the U.S. is nine years. On the other hand, I think for the true crowdfunding, um, we are suggesting strongly that those be done not with, with equity, but with something like a revenue-backed note, where you put cash in and you immediately begin to get a, a small percentage return based on revenues coming in. So you can see it coming in day one, and even if things don't happen in the long term, you'll get your cash, the original cash back out, and it maybe have a capped return of 5x or something, you know, after which the company can graduate to real business angels and, and funds. So there's a serious amount of evolution ahead of us to, uh, uh, I think that, we're, that we're very, very, very Area, young, but a lot area. of change is coming. Yeah. So, um, Paolo, I'm just going to come to you, but just to say, folks, after coming to Paolo, um, I will take some questions. So, if people have, you can um, uh, maybe consider, consider if you have some questions. Paolo, you have personally, uh, to broaden the discussion or conversation, you have personally been involved at a pan European level with um, co investment funds in your home country, um, in Portugal. And I know you have familiarity with a number of other areas. I think it would be very beneficial, perhaps, to maybe just share that tapestry or that uh, information and story with the audience if you would do Paolo yeah, th thank you Michael um, in reality uh, we have seen um, several changes in terms of the market uh, concerning the um, the role of the states and the government in terms of this area some some years ago the if the the government wanted to to help the startups what they would do is to create a venture capital fund and w they would invest in the startups some other governments also would do grants free money and in, i think in europe we are a little bit addicted to this free money i don't understand why there is free money in europe so if there is some uh, uh, startup that uh, needs, let's say, 1 million euros, and this startup receives these 1 million euros, and this startup is successful. In four or five years, this startup is, is having four or five million euros in terms of uh, uh, profit. Why this startup could not take these 1 million euros back to the system? Why all of us in Europe are giving free this money that this company does not need anymore? So this company was successful, and the company should uh, bring this money back. And if we change this way that we deploy the money, we can have six times more money in Europe. So we see a lot of discussions about uh, budget constraints. We see a lot of fights between the European Parliament, European Commission, about the budgets and the European Council. But nobody talked about the way we deploy the money. If we make this small change, we can do a lot. And talking about the, the co-investment funds, what we see in a lot, of, uh, a lot of places is that the governments realize that the angels are a fantastic way to, to invest in startups. And so that the governments are not good deciding which startups they should invest. And so they are creating co-investment funds. We have seen this, of course, in Scotland. We have seen this in Netherlands. We have seen this in Portugal. We have, um, we have seen this in a, a lot of other places. Just to give uh, an example of Portugal, um, the, when we talked with the Portuguese government, the Portuguese government said there was no money. They didn't have money. And so what uh, we have done is we used the structural youth funding so because it is free. And the most part of the countries, they have uh, this ERDF money. So they can use this money instead of giving grants, transform it into co-investment funds. And that makes a big change because in reality, a grant is a co-investment fund with zero return in terms of, the, of the, the, the state. So if they put some money and even if they lose 50%, it's better to have 50% than 0% in terms of the, of the, for, the, for the government. And of course, it creates uh, jobs and uh, helps and the growth. Just, Sorry, please, David. Yes. I would note that in the US, virtually every local economic development fund works exactly the way you, you suggest. Which which is, it's a, it's a loan with appropriate terms, doesn't have to get paid back, it's not long-term equity for the most part, or if it is, it's subordinated to everybody else. Um, but at the end of the day, if the company is successful, the money goes back and gets reused into the pot. That makes a lot of sense. 
Yep. And Paolo, just briefly, give us a sense of the scale and the numbers on the um, co-investment fund uh, in Portugal. And perhaps prior to that, because I mean, you've told me about this before, and it was based on the EU structural funding. Now, EU structural funding is available in all countries, but most countries haven't been able to uh, get it applied in the way you succeeded in Portugal. So you might just comment on that first of all, how you managed that first part and then give us a sense of the scale of it, if you would do the numbers. Yeah, the, the largest uh, co-investment fund in Europe is um, in Netherlands. Uh, they have uh, already invested 250 million euros. So it's the Netherlands is the, the number one country in terms of that co-investment scheme. In Portugal, uh, there was uh, created a co-investment fund of 42 million uh, euros uh, in, the, in the start. And uh, it allowed the creation of 54 angel syndicates. And basically, there is a need of having three angels to invest together that they are accredited by the state. So those angels are accredited and so they can co-invest automatically. One uh, really important thing is what is what we consider a co-investment scheme. I've seen a lot of people say, no, but we have here in our country, we have a venture capital fund that can co-invest uh, with angels, but that is not what we call a co-investment scheme with angels. The decisions must be done by the angels. If the decisions are not done by the angels, then we do not consider it a co-investment scheme uh, with angels. And in Portugal, as in Netherlands, and even on the EIF, the European Angel Fund, the decisions are done by the investors, not by bureaucrats or by uh, governments or other uh, anybody else. And, and, give me an, and that's actually a very important point because what this does is appropriately leverage the wisdom of the crowds. And in this case, it's not the crowd's wisdom, it's the wisdom of the aggregated business angel investors. So many business angel networks in the US have what are called sidecar funds yes. that where, where the members can invest and the fund invests alongside it. New York Angels had a fund and our, our requirements was that if five business angel members invested individually in a deal, at least $250,000 US, then our sidecar fund would automatically invest in, the, uh, in that fund. And the results from that fund have actually been better than almost everybody's individual investments because what you end up doing is you have the investors, the wisdom of these investors, picking ones that they are all putting their cash in and you, and you average it out over a period of time and you get great returns. But just for clarity on that sidecar fund, I mean, the people who invest in the sidecar, they don't make any decisions on the individual investments. Correct, correct. correct. It's, yeah, it's an, yeah. but, but that's the whole thing about a, a government fund following on the mm -hmm. angels. Let mm -hmm. the angels, mm -hmm. the, the role, I think, increasingly of business angel networks and of the accelerators like Wira, which is doing a fantastic mm -hmm. job, are to serve as curators mm -hmm. of this extraordinary feed, this fire hose of opportunity mm -hmm. that is sweeping the world now with all these startups. And the question is, I mean, on, on Gust, we are, you know, getting between, you know, seven and 10,000 companies every month who are, who are coming onto the platform. That's a lot of startup companies there, and no one person, no matter how good we all are here, can, can analyze all those companies. So you look for indicators and keys, and business angel networks and accelerators are all handling this curation function, which is where you can best apply government dollars. Yeah, it's, um, I, mean, I come, come to you, Paolo, or just on the angel ecosystem, I guess, in Ireland, you know, it's relatively young. It's made a lot of progress in a short period of time. I fully believe we have a lot more progress ahead of us than behind us, but I think the sidecar vehicle is something that's extremely interesting. Paolo, in, I know you're coming back in, you mentioned in doing so, you mentioned the scale of the fund was about 42 million. You might also share though an example, you know, of a, tip, a, 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 you know, a, a typical example as well in terms of individual, um, individual investment through the co-investment fund, what kind of scale we're talking about in that regard. Um, the 40, the, um, the average uh, investment per, on, on the co-investment scheme is about 200,000 euros, so the, the size of the deal. So it's not uh, 2 million euros or 3 million euros, it's, it's quite uh, small deals, but you can have uh, deals for 100,000 euros or you can have deals for 500,000 euros in terms of investment. Just coming back, um, because I think this conversation is really interesting and uh, because you started with, uh, you also mentioned crowdfunding. And because of this issue of the, the, the role of the angels, we see now uh, several crowdfunding platforms that only work with angel networks or accredited angels that will be the lead investors. And this solves the issue of uh, the crowd to invest in deals that they don't understand. And so this is, um, I see a lot of uh, cooperation between uh, this crowdfunding area and um, the angel networks. Just a, a last remark on crowdfunding. Uh, we always talk about crowdfunding, but in reality, there are four types of crowdfunding. We have the donation-based crowdfunding, that it doesn't impact our ecosystem. Uh, we have the reward uh, crowdfunding, 
type of, of investment. And this reward for angels, I think this is a fantastic thing because when we have an entrepreneur that comes to us and I have this fantastic product and that will revolutionize the world, but he doesn't have traction. What we can say is, okay, go to these reward crowdfunding platforms, try to get pre-sales, try to see if the crowd wants to buy your product, and if the crowd wants to buy your product, then I can invest. So this is crowdfunding, the reward crowdfunding for me is a risk mitigator for angels, and I love it. Great. Absolutely. Um, questions, folks? Anybody from the floor that um, wants to ask the panel a question? Um, please come forward to the microphones if you do. I have, I have lots more I want to ask the guys myself, but I much prefer the questions come from the floor. Hi, my name is uh, Patrick Crawford, and uh, my question hi, hi. is actually for uh, David. Uh, David, how, do you, how differently do the banks in the US operate with angel investors and startup funds uh, compared to Europe, or would you have a view of that? Uh, we get the impression there's a lot of difficulty with uh, funds from European banks here and getting them out uh, into startup funds without having to actually give personal guarantees or asset-backed uh, um, uh, guarantees to the banks. Does that work differently in, in the US and how do you find that working for okay. your networks? Sure, I totally heard that was the question how, how the relation between banks and the angels. The relation between banks and angels non-existent. There is no relationship. No relationship. Banks <laughs> and angels. Um, and banks, banks and startups. So, so I mean bank, banks in the, in the US are they are money making institutions who are in the business of renting their money out and getting a, an assured return and not taking a risk. So therefore banks and startups are on opposite ends of the universe um, and uh, there, there, there's no correlation. So um, banks would love to come in after the angels and the VCs have proved out the company. What we are seeing, however, is in a couple of cases is something called venture debt in which a special, a very, very few banks or a few special types of organizations are coming in and leveraging debt on top of a major funding from a, a VC. And, and they typically will, will come in um, with extraordinary terms for them because it's extraordinarily risky. So typically they start getting paid back immediately out of, and, and they want to invest no more money than the venture capitalists are putting in so they have a good chance of getting it back. Uh, so, so that actually has proved to be very interesting in a number of cases where you have a business generation revenue with that kind of cash but banks typically and what level of risk profile are, we are you talking about the likes of Silicon Valley Bank yeah. or are you okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, so Silicon Valley Bank is, is one of the very few two or three who do what's called venture debt which is which is a very specific type of thing it's it's highly selective and they will only invest at the same time as a venture fund with the venture fund subordinated to the debt with a very with it with a high interest return paid off immediately with a real equity kicker um, and it so it makes it really not possible for almost any kind of startups we see early on. Yeah. Um, Michael, can I just, uh, just comment one thing that because this question was really important. Once one bottleneck I see in Europe in many countries is that um, if there is a VC investing in a, in a, in a company and there is a, a, a board member that is appointed by the VC and the company needs a loan the bank does not require a uh, personal guarantee from the, the board member of that startup that is appointed by the VC. But if it is an angel, they are requiring it. And so I see many in many countries, angels do not want to be on the board of directors because of this issue. So we need to work with the, with the, the bank industry in order to, for them to recognize angels, investors, as VCs not requiring personal guarantees because this is preventing the angels to take board seats. But that, that's one major difference between Europe and the US. The US is a much more free market economy. Mm -hmm. There's a lot less government, direct government involvement. There's less banking involvement. It's, it's very much a sort of free market uh, economy. So I, I don't know of any single angel in the US who would ever give a personal guarantee for anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of um, company. Okay, we have, but in okay. Europe they do. <laughs> Um, we have another question, please. Go ahead, yes. Introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank oh, it's you. Very well. Sorry, I can't see. Very well. Go ahead. Thank you, Viral Pekka European Commission. I have two questions, if it's possible. One uh, backing on the on the previous one, regard, uh, but this one relating to the about the relation between the banks and startups, because uh, European Commission via both Horizon 2020 and Cosme is providing guarantees and contra guarantees uh, exactly to uh, you know support the banks lending to the innovative startups. So my question is, from the field, do you see that these guarantees are working and indeed are improving the, the, the access to debt for startups? Uh, number one, and the second question is relating to crowdfunding. 
Um, Mr. Gerard Ryan was mentioning before that European Commission is thinking to regulate the, the crowdfunding regime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we are getting mixed signals about that. So some uh, stakeholders are saying, well, there is a need for this, uh, let's say, uh, regulation to have a uni uniform regime in Europe, but others are saying, no, please stay away, it's okay as it is today, and so on. Wh wh what's, your, what's your feedback there? Okay, yeah, thank you, Viol. Uh, I, I'll summarize uh, maybe the two questions. We take the first question and ask maybe Mark um, um, Horgan, the IVCA, to take it. And um, the question really in essence is that the European Commission already provides some support in terms of banking guarantees. So what are we seeing on the ground in reality for startups? Is that feeding its way through or not, Mark? Um, well, I, I, my experience is that it's very unusual in Ireland for a startup to, um, to borrow money from a bank. I, I don't think I've ever seen it, actually. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't make good business for the bank and it doesn't make good business for a startup. Um, by their nature, you know, they're too risky. That's why equity capital is invested in, um, in, in early stage startups and early stage companies and not debt. Um, I am familiar with them. Um, companies who are at a growth equity stage who, uh, as David uh, mentioned already, um, raise venture debt as part of um, uh, a round of funding coming from a VC. So, for instance, if $5 million is being raised by a VC, or sorry, by raise, being raised by a company, you might see 1.5 million of that coming from the likes of Silicon Valley Bank. And in Ireland, actually, uh, Silicon Valley Bank has been funded by the um, uh, the uh, National Pension Reserve Fund, uh, now the uh, Ireland Strategic Investment Fund, uh, to encourage that type of venture debt um, availability. Um, I am aware, in, uh, I think, in, uh, the European, through the European Investment Bank, um, they have released funding, which was uh, administered by, I think it was AIB in Ireland, um, for uh, low-cost debt going into um, uh, 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 kind of maybe Series B type, A B type um, uh, companies, you know, beyond the the the, um, the early stage where you'd have revenues, it would be approaching profitability. Uh, typically, that was to fund working capital requirements, yeah. and I think that has worked well. I'm involved with a company actually in, in one of my portfolio companies, who has who has got uh, funding on that and at really good um, uh, terms um, as well. Uh, totally different to, say, venture debt, which is normally about 14%. Okay, thanks, Mark. And um, maybe just a very brief comment for you, Viral. I guess in Ireland, because we've been through such a tsunami, our macro you know, difficulties, I think some of those instruments that are in place maybe haven't perhaps fully fed their way down to the earlier stage companies. Your second question, and I want to be brief on this because I guess we have a crowdfunding panel tomorrow, um, but you're, I think, asking essentially that you're getting mixed signals at a European Commission level in terms of what level of regulation is needed in the crowdfunding area. Um, and that can come from the market, but perhaps I might ask Gerard to give us a, maybe a commentary on that, if you would. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, to follow on the comments earlier on, I'd be nervous, you know, especially in a jurisdiction like the US where you have class action lawsuits about, you know, taking in equity um, from the crowd because, um, you know, if, if pe people want to make a, you know, a bet on a, a sports game and they lose, you know, they walk away from it, but, but people, if they, if they make a bet on a company and lose, will put their hands up and say, well, the information wasn't provided to me. So I think there's going to be big issues around equity crowdfunding. I think if it, if it does take off, it probably will be in some form of, of debt instrument. Um, just on, on, the, on the, the venture bank, banking part of it, again, I'm aware that, that Silicon Valley Bank are quite active in Ireland at the moment, but it's a very small amount of money available. It's maybe 100 million euros. So I think it's, it's quite a niche product. They tend to invest in venture capital um, firms. What I mean by that is they rely on a venture capital firm to, to do their diligence, and then if they see them ba backing something, they, they will roll in behind that. But I think it's, it's quite a niche area and isn't really a a replacement or a substitute for, for, um, for business angel or for seed funding. Okay, folks, I'm conscious of trying to keep it all moving at, at, at pace because we have a very busy schedule. So we'll take a final question if there is anybody in a moment and while, while, while we're um, um, asking for that. Paolo, I might just come back to yourself. You've spent uh, your career in, as an entrepreneur and exiting and as a business angel, but in particular over the last couple of years, as I commented on earlier, you know, enormously directly involved across all of Europe um, uh, in the business angel area. What's your perspective on where we're, you know, the, imp the combination of policy, I suppose, changes underway and then the market foresight, which might not be as strong as the US, where is that taking us in the future, do you think, with business angel? 
<clears throat> I think that one thing that uh, we have been discussing here as well is uh, about, uh, for instance, this crowdfunding, if it's the European Union should, uh, European Commission should rule it or not. Uh, we have a problem in Europe. Uh, we have uh, 28 uh, markets, different markets. And so if one company wants to scale, the, the company goes to US. And if we do not address this problem of the early stage market and to create a single early stage market in Europe, we will never be able to scale the companies in Europe. And that's one of the issues that we should have um, the possibility of these companies to go to each market. And so on the crowdfunding, if we could have rules that any platform could raise money from any uh, EU country at least, and uh, any company could go to that platform and raise money there, this would change dramatically what we see in terms of Europe. In terms of the angels market, I see that uh, in terms of the, the, there will be a constant growth, but I see uh, very strong uh, uh, signs from several countries. So for instance, I've been in Turkey and there was just one single angel that invested uh, $30 million, just one single angel. So this uh, changes. I see a lot of uh, impact investment. I see all those foundations that had, that mean before they were giving grants for Africa, they now discover that they can invest in startups that can change um, the way uh, Africa lives. For instance, if someone finds out a device that can purify the water and this device is sold by one euro, these uh, foundations can invest in this uh, startup and the same amount of money, they will have a much bigger impact. So I see that this early stage will grow, but there are several bottlenecks that were identified in our manifesto that ne they need to be uh, sorted out. Otherwise, we are just talking about potential and not reality. And actually, just on that subject matter of um, impact investing, just to mention tomorrow morning, um, we have Hedda um, Muller from the EBAN um, board who will moderate a session on impact investing. So we can find out a little bit more there. Any final question from the floor? Um, if not, then I'd be delighted to ask David a, a final question. David, we're delighted, delighted obviously to have you here with us um, in Dublin for the European conference. Um, any perspective you have on, I guess, what you're seeing in Europe and what you're seeing in the US, and of course, uh, they're very different markets in many ways, but in the whole angel world, what are your observations and anything you can share with us that might be beneficial for us? Sure, I mean, I, I think what, what Paolo said was, was right on target. Angel, business angel investing is here to stay. It is growing. You, you saw you know, Lucius' things mm -hmm. about the, the, the growth of, of uh, business angels uh, in Europe over the last decade. It's been consistent. In the US, it's happening, and it's, it's, it's growing. Um, as we now see the democratization of capital, as less and less money needed to start a company, as more and more uh, countries moving to um, sort of capitalist, democratic, open, globalized societies, as technology being applied to more and more industries, you are seeing a sea change in the way the world works. I mean, I, I have said that any company that was designed for success in the 20th century is doomed to failure in the 21st mm -hmm. because the entire world is changing. And what that means is that every successful business in the 21st century is going going to be a new business that is starting now, that is starting up from any of these locations, and that is being funded with small amounts of money from people like people in this room, from professional business angels. So the reason I wrote, sorry, the reason I wrote the, the book, mm -hmm. um, uh, How to Make Money and, and Have Fun in Investing in Startups, is because the, the hope was to pro help professionalize the business. And that's what Ebon is doing, and that's what the ACA is doing. And it is remarkably heartening to, to see everybody in this room understands how risky business angel investing is. It's unlike the press where, oh, you put a, you, mm -hmm. you're gambling and you put it in the slot machine and you make a billion dollars the next week. That's not the way this works. It's one out of 10, it's one out of 20 that provide your, your, your 30, 40, 50x return. But ultimately, if you invest intelligently and rationally with a long-term perspective and you do your diligence and you source appropriately and you curate appropriately, you can absolutely get really high returns while increasing the economy and increasing jobs. And I think the future is really golden for business angel investing. And uh, Dave, come on, Dave, thank you.
And we, 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 we conclude the panel now, but just, just as I do two things, um, David's book, which um, encapsulates all of, the, all of the above and more, is available, only recently launched, available through all electronic stores, etc. Just a final comment, because you've commented a couple of times, and I think it's an enormously important message with regard to the professionalization of the business angel community. And most people know that the visible or per, uh, business angel market, a formal business angel market, probably accounts for 10 to 15 percent. So just comment on where you think that can go, just briefly. So, so historically, business you know, business angel investing, the term business angels was only applied to what we do in the last 20 years or thereabouts. Um, before that, it was a, I mean, I'm actually a third generation business angel investor. My great uncle, who was born in 1885, was, a, was a, the angel behind the portable kidney dialysis unit and vascular stapling and stuff. But that was almost unheard of. I mean, even his own family, people had no idea what he did. Mm -hmm. Now, and so it was, you know, after that, it was rich people, you know, seeing somebody at a country club and, and throwing a couple of dollars at it because they thought it was a, a fun thing. What everybody in this room is doing is looking at this as a part of an alternative asset class that makes sense. And if you, and nobody here is doing this for fun or gamble. I don't think anybody in this room consider themselves a gambler. I mean, I don't think so. Rick, don't we, ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, but I, I really, I don't think so because I, I know this crowd. I mean, we, I've been coming to EBA now for, for you know, clearly you know, nearly a decade. Um, I mean, these, what you are doing is what ACA is doing, what people like John Houston is, is doing, former chairman of the Angel Capital Association, um, Bill Payne and John May from, from the U.S. folks who, who come over here. Um, we are all together from these organizations and, and these bands creating an asset class which has is very different from banking or investing in stocks or, or bonds. It is very risky, it is long term, it is illiquid, but A, it has very high returns. And if you understand how it works, that it is very risky, that it's one out of 10 or one out of 20, and you do it appropriately, you can not only get a return, but you can change the economies of the world. And that's the way the economies are going. So I think it's really special times. And with a heritage like that, with your great gra your grandfather, I think it would be uh, good for you to talk to Wayne Allen uh, and his um, embolization technology. <laughs> <laughs> presented earlier. Um, I'd like to thank Paolo, um, David Rose, Jared Ryan, and Mark Horgan. Thank you, folks. Thank you.